BCW died 24 years ago as of me speaking and yet people still love it. That means they did something right. Feeling very much like the underground promotion that didn't give a flub, Extreme Championship Wrestling paved the way for a lot of what we expect today, and they changed the game. They also did a lot of weird stuff. That was true when it came to the main event, so hello my friends, my name is Simon Miller. And let's take a mad walk down ECW memory lane. Number 10, Rob Van Dam vs. Balls Mahoney at Anarchy Rules 1999. Let's not forget Balls Mahoney was called Balls for the reason you think. That is ECW. The late Jonathan Reckner's most famous character was a mainstay of the promotion, winning the tag team titles a handful of times and always being involved in something crazy. Even though he was super popular, he was never portrayed as the top guy which is why it was interesting when he did get put into the main event at 1999's Anarchy Rules. There were some asterisks in the sense this was for the TV title and not the World Championship, as that had already been defended. Taz had put it on the line against Mike Awesome and Masato Tanaka. Now, this could be important because Taz had already made it clear to Paul Heyman he was heading to the WWF, so I wonder if this was why the card was structured this way. We do know it hurt their relationship a little bit. Even if true, it was nice balls got his moment, as you have to imagine, he also got a nice payoff too. Maybe all of the ECW roster deserve that. If you know, you know. It's been talked about on many a video. Number 9, Mike Awesome vs Spike Dudley at Guilty as Charged 2000. We could just leave it there. That's a weird match, let alone in the main event. This is why ECW was so great though, just do what works. If you never saw Spike in the promotion too, his role was exactly the same as in WWE. Get whooped. He never won a title under Paul Heyman, but that wasn't for lack of trying. The company teased it a lot. This is why at Guilty as Charged 2000, Dudley went against Mike Awesome for the World Championship, and the whole story was telling you, damn it, Spike is gonna do it. Talk about getting this right too. Some of the near falls drawing this sent the crowd nuts, and because it was ECW, you could believe they did mad stuff all the time. Eventually, Awesome finished him off, but yeah, these were the type of risks other promotions should have been watching just made you cheer for the underdog that's a really important part of wrestling number eight jimmy snooker versus terry funk at bloodfest 93 so let's throw a curveball in there this is when ecw was just eastern championship wrestling and still part of the nwa even here though we were hinting at the future a supercard held over two nights that also saw the debuts of tommy dreamer taz and sabu who didn't realize how important they were going to be the main event was instead between two recognizable names Terry Funk and Jimmy Snooker. They fought in a cage for the TV title and look, we all know Funk's relationship with the company, but Snooker was also the first guy to hold the then EC World Championship. This was properly bloody and brutal too with Terry getting the win, and within a year the Superfly was gone entirely. That same month one Paul Heyman joined the promotion, and the rest as they say, is history. Number 7, Jake Roberts vs Mr Hughes at the ASWA ECW MEWF Super Show in 1993. Well, what a fantastic name for an event, it really rolls off the tongue. This was in November though when three promotions came together to put on one card, but do not try and find it, it's next to impossible. I don't get what happened, but it's been wiped off the face of the planet. It is real though and featured an ECW title match between Taz and Sabu, but this wasn't the main event, that did indeed go to Jake Roberts and Mr. Hughes. Now Hughes was an odd one, because while he was a journeyman, he was best known as Chris Jericho's bodyguard in his early WWF days, and of course we all knew the other guy, Jake was a legend. The written reports state the man with the snake won in about 14 minutes, and really we should have switched these scraps around, but I suppose that's hindsight. I mean Roberts would even have another run with the World Wrestling Federation in 1996, so his name still carried some serious weight. I was just going to hazard a guess though, I don't really think it needed to close the show. Number 6, Cactus Jack vs DC Drake at the return of the Funker 95. So I'm sure you can figure it out with the name, we were celebrating the return of Terry Funk, otherwise this would have been bizarre. There is some oddness here however, because did Funk have a match on this card? No. No, he didn't. His protege Cactus Jack did get in the main event, however. He didn't know who his opponent was going to be. That was chosen by woman or the then Nancy Sullivan, and she picked DC Drake. I don't know who that is. Don Clyde Drake was his full name, and he was actually retired at this point. Hence why he was brought in and lost in four minutes. Huh. This was the idea, though, because as soon as we were done, Terry walked to the ring and whooped Jack's ass along with Drake Woman and the Sandman. Tommy Dreamer and Shane Douglas also got involved with Shane going babyface, so really the main event was just one big angle. 
But hey, at least Terry Funk featured heavily. That's all the fans wanted anyway. Number five, Terry Funk and King Kong Bundy versus Sabu and Road Warrior Hawk. A November to Remember 1993. Four years before it came a full-on pay-per-view, November to Remember started life as a big annual super show from the ECW arena. Soon it was dubbed as their version of WrestleMania, and how did the first one end? A mess of a tag team match, which kind of was similar to the original Mania. Road Warrior Hawk was drafted in to team with world champion Sabu, with the other side being TV champion Funk and a mystery partner. This was indeed WrestleMania 2 main eventer King Kong Bundy. I think ECW were just desperate to make this really complicated because both titles were on the line, so of course Bundy turned on Terry, allowing Sabu to become a double champ. I mean, at least it wasn't boring. But it was totally, woefully bonkers. Number four, Crash the Terminator and Migueletto Perez versus the Headhunters at Ultra Crash 93. So what we're learning today is that ECW in 1993 was off the wall. Paul Heyman still wasn't around, but you wouldn't know he wasn't part of this. It was a bloodbath. The Headhunters had their first of three main events here as they faced Migueletto Perez, who would actually go on to be part of Los Pericas in the WWF, and of course, Crash the Terminator. You probably recognize him as Hugh Morris or Bill DeMott, and this bizarre combo of wrestlers had a big old fight with blood spilling almost instantly. The Headhunters eventually got the win, but everybody was left in such a state. It was a proper war, and I warn you, it is not for everyone. Number three, Sid versus Skull Von Crush at House Party 1999. ECW ran four supercards at House Party from 1996 to 1999. And the last version was indeed closed out thanks to the master and ruler of the world. Sid was just called Sid here and was so over with these ECW fans. Although in terms of this time period, it was a one and done. He soon went back to WCW, but not before main eventing here against the amazingly named Skull Von Crush with a K. Now this was Vito Lagrasso or Big Vito elsewhere, and in the semi-main we did see Taz retain his world title against Shane Douglas. Why this wasn't last I don't know, because Sid came to the ring and ended Skull in just three minutes. It was a destruction. It was also Sid's second out of five EC matches in total and again. I can see why they brought him back. Sid got mega pops all the time because he felt like a star. I think he must have enjoyed it too. He didn't really have to do much of anything but soak in all those cheers. Number two, Rick Rude the Sandman and Tommy Dreamer versus Sabu, Rob Van Dam, and Jerry Lawler at Heatwave 97. So Jerry Lawler hated ECW. This was the story on Raw as the WWF and Extreme Championship Wrestling teamed up. Yeah, the king would take any opportunity to knock on him. It meant the ECW roster invaded Monday night on the 24th of February and told Lawler he was going to get it. Jerry didn't appreciate that, which brought us to Heat Wave 1997, where the king did indeed head into the main event. It was in a steel cage, because why the flub not, and the three men tasked with teaching him RVD and Sabu a lesson were Rick Rude the Sandman and Tommy Dreamer and it went bad. This is because Rude turned on his friends to prove he was WWF for life, and Taz also turned up here. He slapped Lawler and locked him in the Taz mission. It is hard to fathom now, but seeing the World Wrestling Federation's color commentator get choked out like this was so surreal, especially because Vince McMahon never worked with anyone, and yet look, it's happening. Here we are. Number one, Terry Funk versus Bret Hart at WrestleFest 97. Well, this one was amazing. Just two months after Jerry Lawler showed up in ECW, the WWF relationship took an extra step forward. WrestleFest was put on to celebrate the career of Terry Funk, who was going to retire, which yes, yeah, sounds silly today, but at the time, that was the intent. Funk also wanted to wrestle someone special for his fake final bout. And yep, after asking for Bret Hart, he actually got the green light. This was great. The event also had Mick Foley versus Sabu, and when we got to our main event, it was fought under no disqualification rules. That was because Terry wanted to go crazy, and of course he lost. He was as old school as they came. He wanted to go out on his back. Do not forget the Hitman was the WWF champion at the time, so this was truly strange. But it showed how respected Funk was. Everybody knew his contributions to the business. Around 4,000 people attended this too, and amazingly, Terry was back in the ring 11 days after this because he headed out to Japan. So bless that man. He just couldn't let it go. Know of any other bizarre ECW main events that we should be talking about? Please do leave us a comment below before you like the video, share the video, and subscribe. You can then click the video on the screen to get even more ECW facts for your wrestling pub quiz you're going to on Friday night. But otherwise, thank you very much, my friends. And I will talk to you again soon.